My name is Gladys Carrion, and I am currently at the Columbia Justice Lab as a senior research scholar and senior fellow. I am the prior commissioner for the city of New York, the administration for children's services and running the juvenile justice system and the child welfare system and the early learning system in the city. And prior to that, I was the state commissioner, uh, the office for children and families where I also ran the juvenile justice system, the child welfare system and the early learning system for the state of New York. But I think overall the issue of equity, uh, the issue of racism that limits our ability on mobility and access to opportunity in this country uh, is really a really important issue for our community. You know, and particularly we are focused now on criminal justice. And I think, you know, my work has been um, in that arena on the juvenile justice side. Um, but I, I continue to be really concerned about whether or not we as a community, as Latinas, Latinos, will ever in this country have the equality that we have should have as citizens in this country and citizens in Puerto Rico. You know, I think the struggle continues to be one of access and opportunity uh, and ensuring the well-being of our community and being able to reap the benefits of our citizenship and our labor in this country. Um, and you know, we share that with other people of color. I think that will continue to be the overarching issue in our struggle as a people um, to really be recognized for what we have contributed to this country um, and our worth uh, in this country equal to any other citizen. Um, but you know, in the immediate realm, you know, we continue to be concerned about our safety. We continue to be concerned about the safety of our children. Um, and these systems institutionalize racism, the structural uh, inequalities, inequity that are inherent in these systems that capture many of us. And so I think that that will be the most immediate uh, struggle for us is how do we deal with this structural racism that limits our opportunities? You know, there's so many ways uh, I, I feel um, that are impactful to really effectuate change. and 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 transformational change um, that everybody can really engage in. You know, when I, and I continue to do this work, as I do this work, you don't do it in silos. It's really important to do it on a lot of parallel tracks. So, you know, demonstrations are really important. You know, raising your voice, being involved um, and as an advocate, uh, voting, right? Being engaged in the electoral process, being engaged in community movements, and community organizations, you know, being donating. You know, I tell this to people all the time. You don't have to be, if it's not who you are, you don't have to be out in the streets, uh, but th there's power to the resources you have, whether it's money that you can contribute, whether it's writing those op-ed pieces, whether it's being part of the political process, um, or whether or not it's inside government in actually running these systems, working in these systems, you know, as a lawyer representing uh, young people and people that are captured in our systems in a variety of different systems. You know, there are a lot, there are a multitude of ways that you, one can get engaged, one can get involved that makes change. You know, whatever you do, I really do feel that you can create change in whatever position, in any involvement that you have. Uh, whether it's professional, whether it's your civic involvement, whether it's simply voting, you can make a difference. You know, I think that you have to be open to change and you have to be open um, to collaboration and working with others. You know, I found that really, and opportunities, you know, you have to be open to opportunities. And I think that one of the things that that has characterized my career is the fact one that I've had a lot of jobs. But you know, I've had a lot of jobs because I really do thrive in new environments, in challenges where I see opportunities for me to make a difference, to be involved, to do the hard work. You can't be afraid to do the work. And you know, you don't start off as a leader. You don't start, you know, start by directing these big agencies or by leading nonprofit organizations. You start by working and being involved in your community. You know, and I started as an attorney uh, representing folks 
in my community, which, you know, was the South Bronx and the Bronx where I grew up and was a legal services lawyer starting out and working with community groups, uh, you know, doing everything from incorporations to going to tenant meetings, you know, in family court. I represented parents charged with abuse and neglect, which is how I started doing this work, you know, working in community-based organizations, running nonprofits, and then in government and being involved in my community, participating on community boards, doing that work, and then really maintaining your networks and, and the people that you met in law school, in college, in high school, people in your neighborhood, and really building those relationships and taking some risk. You know, you're not gonna know everything, but you have to be open to learning. Uh, and learning from others, and you have to be open to sharing power. That's really important. You know, change doesn't happen uh, overnight. As much as I'm as impatient as I am, um, and you're not the only one that creates that change. You need to partner with others, and you need to build those networks of support that help you do this work. So I, I really do think it's it's important to be engaged and to be involved in your community, and really understand. You know, what's your passion? What drives you? And then build on that passion and find like-minded folks to help you do this work. It's, you know, you have to do your homework. You know, you have to go to those meetings. You know, you, you just have to engage and do the work. And then you build up, you know, the trust and you people recognize the skills you have and you utilize those skills on behalf of the whole. It's really not about you. And, you know, I, I personally, you know, and I, you know, I, I spoke to Juan about this. I, I really don't accept awards anymore. And this was really special because it's Latino justice and because it's Juan. And, you know, we, we have a long history uh, together, uh, but, you know, it really is not about you. And if you do this work because you think that it's gonna elevate you, then, you know, you gotta rethink this. It really is about your community, how you can make a difference and how you can use the skills that you have, the opportunity that you have, the privilege to be able to go to law school, to have graduated from college, you know, all first for me and my family. And to say, how do I use that privilege that I have? Because it is a privilege um, to better my community. In whatever area you focus on, that needs to be your guiding star to do this work and do it well and do it in a way that is impactful and that it makes a difference. You know, I, you know, I grapple with that having been part of a system um, that causes so much harm, and not only in our community, but across uh, communities of color. And, you know, the change and, and the work that I've done to close facilities, to reduce the footprint of the juvenile justice system in the state and in this city, to really narrow that front door is really not enough. Um, and we really need to dismantle the system as we know it today. You know, the work that I do at Columbia Justice Lab is really to close youth prisons across this country um, and to understand the harm that we've caused, to recognize and reckon with that harm and that we know how to do this better and that our young people deserve better from us. And so I, until we recognize that and seriously dismantle the system as we know it, reimagine it and create a system that is grounded in our community, that is grounded in the well-being of young people and that we understand the science and research that tells us what works, um, we still have a lot of work to do. That's where we need to get to. Uh, I often say that you know, we have, you know, two-track juvenile justice system in this country, one that serves white communities of affluence and one that uh, is the one that captures poor black and brown young people. And until we recognize that and we dismantle that system that captures young people, and not only do we dismantle that system, but the feeders to that system, which brings me to another system that I ran, which is the child welfare system and the foster care system, which really is a feeder system into the juvenile justice system. Until we reimagine, dismantle those systems, uh, we deal with poverty in this country 
that we understand that community does have many of the answers that we need to do better for young people, we're not gonna have justice in this country. Um, and so we need to create different pathways for our young people um, that are grounded in community, that are grounded in science, and that we, you know, that are grounded in love, that we care for these young people, that we embrace them, that these are our children and they're all our children and we have a responsibility. And what we want for our own children is what we should want for these children, you know, our children that are captured in these systems that do such harm. And until we recognize that as a society, the struggle has to continue to do this change. You know, as much work as I did and as many facilities that, that we closed and I had an incredible team of people working with me to be able to do this and how we really have imagined um, juvenile justice in the city of New York, it's an interim step. But I will tell you with all that work and reducing that footprint, narrowing that front door, creating alternatives, doing all the things that we know work that are necessary to do, the disproportionality increased. So even though we had a smaller system and, and, and it is small in New York and I have to say, you know, we have to celebrate when we make progress, it's still overwhelmingly, overwhelmingly black and brown. You know, it's black and Latino children that are captured in these systems. So it's not enough. What I did was not enough. And so that's why, you know, the work that I do now um, really is about reimagining and bringing people together to rethink how we can do this differently. And, you know, one of the things I forgot to mention is that I also serve now as part of the team of the Federal Monitor in Puerto Rico, uh, working in their juvenile justice system. A really, I mean, this system is a really poor, just for me, you know, disheartening uh, system in Puerto Rico and how young people are treated in that system and the fact that it's had a federal monitor for 27 years with little improvement in that system. Yes, they've closed facilities and yes, they've reduced their footprint, but it's not a rehabilitative system. It's not a system grounded in community, not a system grounded in the science of what works. And, you know, and this is across this country. And some, you know, I, I forget, I forget often um, how terrible some of these systems are still today across this country, because we've had some good experience in New York. Um, so there's a lot of work that continues uh, to be necessary and, and reform at the edges is not going to get us where we need to go. But, you know, what I was going to say is that, you know, um, you're absolutely right. Young people that, that are captured, and I say captured, because when we have them, it's hard for them to get out. Um, they really, we need to provide the supports and services that they need. And it shouldn't be in a carceral setting that we provide these services and supports. We should be providing them in communities. Um, and they should be able to, you know, young people do come into the system with a lot of challenges. And these challenges are due to, you know, to many of the social ills that are concentrated in the communities where they live. And so, yeah, you know, they need, we need to do better by them and we need to help improve their outcomes by giving them the, you know, education and schools that function and housing and mental health supports and recreation, all the kinds of supports that any pro-social supports that any young person would need, the same kinds of supports and services that my children had access to, that anybody's children has access to. You know, I often get asked, you know, when people get upset with me about, well, what is it that I want? You know, how would I design a community? And I look at them straight and I say, well, what do you provide for your child? What's available in your community? Our children are not anything different. They're entitled to those kinds of services and supports in their community. And so we need to do better. We need to do better. And you don't do better in a prison. What we built is a surveillance system, you know, uh, in public institutions, whether it's the clinic, whether it's the hospital, whether it's the school, have all become agents of the state and reporting 
on behavior that they deem inappropriate uh, that poor people engage in. Um, it's a different standard uh, than the standard that's imposed on people that are more affluent. I saw that firsthand on my child welfare system that, you know, if ever a white person, uh, and I always like to give examples, somebody in Soho gets reported uh, to the, the state's hotline, you know, how they lawyer up and they're entitled to it, right? About how poor, so we don't get access to their homes. Uh, they're represented by an attorney who dictates the terms of engagement. Um, poor people, where we had our field offices, uh, all in poor communities, didn't have those options. And so we've created this surveillance um, state that just captures black and brown people. Thank you. Thank you for Latino justice for the work that you have done and continue to do. Uh, and for all those lawyers that you have trained and influenced. And I want to thank Juan for his leadership. I know he's announced that he is leaving Latino justice. And I know that you will miss him. But I know that his work and his leadership will continue to benefit our community. But uh, I remember Latino justice very, very early on and you've grown and your success are incredible. And so on. I thank you. I thank you for uh, the work that you do and the work that you continue to do and for the recognition of the work that all of the trailblazers have done that I hope serve as inspiration for other women and everyone that you can make a difference and that Anybody can make a difference. You know, I think of myself, you know, I, I never thought that the girl that grew up on Kelly and Longwood, um, you know, went to public school, would one day become a lawyer and one day have the opportunity and privilege of running these systems and really working to transform them so that they better serve our community. Um, so thank you for the work that you do. You know, I, you know, it's interesting. I, one of the driving force for me was growing up in the South Bronx and Kelly and Longwood, I would say that, and, and really experiencing discrimination uh, and oppression and seeing my parents, you know, who learning English and came to this country, you know, for a better future for their children, quite frankly, working menial jobs, really smart people. Um, and they inspired me, um, you know, the inequities that I experienced, that I saw uh, because we were poor really inspired me to, to make sure that we had a seat at the table, um, that our voice would be heard. And so my parents were really, you know, for me, the two people that really inspired me. Um, you know, I, I, you know, didn't grow up with, with lots of heroines. I think later on when I got to, you know, high school, it was Aspira and Antonia Pantoja um, that I, 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 you know, met and was able to do work with and inspired me and, and really helped me understand uh, who I was as a Puerto Rican uh, and the fact that we could all be leaders and that we all were valuable. Um, and so I think that those, you know, those, those were the things that inspired me to do this work. And then as I did this work, engaging, you know, with, with other people, other women, you know, colleagues um, who worked as hard as I did, that was really inspirational to continue to do this work. And it takes a lot of energy. And, you know, I, you know, so much of the work that I, during the time that I did this work, I was vilified, uh, you know, in the press, um, and by elected officials that oppose many of the things that we were trying to do to make this better for our young people. Um, but the support that I got um, was really important in helping um, you know, me to have the energy to continue to do this work. And so I, I think that's, that's been what the influences that, that have driven me and, and the work that I've been able to do.